okay, then we're back again um, for part two of this first uh, lecture on geopolitical risk. And I'll, I'll switch to some information about what we can regard as prominent correlates of macro level geopolitical risk. And that is, you know, the driving forces that causes you know, changes or causes geopolitical uh, risk that affects international business, multinational corporations. Um, and these are, you know, the, the sources of the effects for international business. And uh, first of these, the first of these are changes in relative power among states changes in relative power among states. And this is really, you know, one of the big issues, perhaps the big issue in international politics, the study of international politics, because the changes in the growth, decline of the big nations, the big states, that has some very um, important effects. Some states grow. Their economies grow, their military grows, some are declining uh, relative to other states. So if we take the obvious example today, the U.S. is in relative decline. The U.S.'s power in relative terms, it, it has started to wane, it has started to decrease. Um, that doesn't mean that the U.S. in an absolute sense gets weaker because its economy grows, not by much each year, but, but it grows, GDP grows, its military budgets uh, has increased in recent years. The problem from the American perspective is that the Chinese GDP and Chinese military budgets grow even more than the US. So the US uh, is slowly on a decline relative to China. And it essentially becomes, and we know that from countless historical examples, it essentially becomes a competition, a rivalry between these major powers on how different specific regions should be, um, who should influence the specific regions, who should influence the world, who should um, shape the rules of the game in, in politics and in, in uh, business. Uh, who should shape international institutions. Um, so you can, you, can, um, you can call the relationship now between the US and China as a rivalry that has to do with these things. And these are the background factors that probably shape some of the specific policies that the US is instituting against China, which in turn increases the geopolitical risk. Um, and we know that, as I said, from countless examples that historically that have often led to wars, which is, you know, the ultimate effect and, and mostly in, in negative terms. Um, but it's not only about the US and China, because over the years you have these shifts within regions, in the world at large, you have this, this shift. Sometimes, you know, big powers become weaker powers relative to other states. Sometimes it's the opposite. Um, when Germany was unified in, in 1870, 71, for instance, it created a lot of these, you know, um, effects instability, insecurity for the, the uh, established uh, major powers. And that was one of the, you know, the driving forces behind the First World War, these changes in relative power. It was not only about Germany. Um, when Germany was, was, became Germany, uh, suddenly you had this bigger power in the center of Europe making the other states nervous because uh, a bigger German power meant that their, the other state's relative power decreased. Uh, but we'll talk, or rather I will talk uh, more about this, this in later lecture, but this is kind of the fundamental thing um, 
that we have to 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 watch and watch very closely and some of the readings that you have for today and these are really for the first lecture newspaper readings from a couple of years back uh, some estimations predictions explanations of the geopolitical risk landscape some of these readings um, briefly mention and, and walk you through this, you know, argument about relative power, that it changes, uh, you know, the environment for international business. It changes the level of, of risk. The, the second big thing, prominent correlate of macro-level geopolitical risk is, is, of course, related to the first one. It's, it's about the actual decision strategies of major power. So it matters a lot what these big states do. Often it matters also what medium-sized states do um, and, and don't do. Uh, what the U.S. does is always important. What the president of the U.S. decides is often important because it's always important because the U.S. carries so much weight in terms of power resources. Its economy is so large. It largely runs or, or controls or shapes the international financial system. The role of the dollar is so, so great. The U.S. military is enormous relative to, to um, other states, still enormous. Uh, what China does and doesn't do is all, also extremely important. The preferences China has when it comes to, to businesses, when it comes to territorial matters, when it comes to matter of status, etc. So, of course, in general, the bigger the country, the more weight it carries, the more geopolitical risk that country is able to create. And in fact, uh, for the last few years, nobody uh, has created such, you know, waves in terms of geopolitical risk as the U.S because the U.S. has on certain areas, certain important areas, changed their strategy. You have trade wars, you have economic sanctions, you have um, withdrawal of military from some key areas, you have the introduction of military in some key areas. Um, but again, the bigger the state, the more weight it, it carries. The third prominent correlate is interstate conflict patterns interstate conflict patterns, which means that the landscape of geopolitical risk uh, largely parallels the landscape of interstate conflict. Uh, it largely parallels the, um, the patterns of international politics. So when you have a, for instance, an interstate conflict like the US and China, to, to take that example again, it spills over and it and then and then very important dimension of that conflict is the economic sphere it has to do with international business uh, japan and south korea are also and have been for a year or two uh, in a diplomatic crisis conflict um, which has to do with, you know, old wounds from the Second World War, old wounds from the annexation that Japan, uh, or the annexation of Korea by Japan in, in 1910. And these are historical roots that have recently, you know, blossomed again, to, to put it like that. And this concrete case has to do with, with, um, uh, with, some existing Japanese companies, which used to, during the Cold War, to use slave labor, Korean slave labor. And, and uh, that diplomatic conflict is, is related to the economic or the business sphere. And again, these two spheres, these two areas, they're, they're really parallel in, in many respects. The Middle East conflicts. The Iran conflict, U.S.-Iran conflict, the conflict between Iran and its neighbors in the Gulf region, it has a lot to do with international business, it has a lot to do with the economic sphere. So this is really mainly, of course, dwelling on international politics, but its impact on international business. The fourth prominent correlate of, uh, of micro-level geopolitical risk is what we can call globalization, economic globalization and its 
discontents, it's the opposition against globalization. And, and this is, um, as I showed on a previous slide, you know, after the Cold War ended, you've had a clear rise of economic globalization, increased cross-border trade, cross-border investment. And that has created prosperity on an average level. So people, uh, countries, on average, become richer. People, on average, in many countries, in most countries, in fact, become richer. Um, that's, and that's pretty clear. So you have increased prosperity on average in the world and in most regions of the world. Uh, you have increased prosperity in America and the US. You have increased prosperity in the European Union, in Asia, large parts of Asia. At the same time, you have a lot of losers from globalization. And of course, the most prominent examples of this are is firstly the American presidential elections in 2016, which had to do with these issues of the losers from globalization. And it has also and and, and it also showed in the Brexit decision, the UK leaving the European Union. Some of the driving forces was discontent um, showed by the, the um, what we can deem as losers from globalization. Because globalization creates prosperity, but it also creates insecurity and a need to, for people, many people, many workers to adapt. Because globalization is also about international competition. Manufacturing in the US, the obvious example. People lose their jobs because they're outcompeted by you know, Asian firms, where labor is cheaper. Workers in the US, they have to adapt, which means they have to retrain, they have to find new jobs. That creates instability, insecurity, it creates problems for families, for individuals, and many, many millions of them. Uh, so you have these losers from, from globalization, which also has a political voice. And that was clear in the, in the election of President Donald Trump, because Trump, he took on their case and argued against globalization. He argued that manufacturing should, be, uh, should grow in the U.S. And, and um, the basic issue here is about, you know, a phenomenon like globalization, it creates its own opposition. That doesn't mean that it will all unravel and, and you will have a reversal uh, of globalization, but it means that you have you know, challenges, opposition, and it's not an easy ride. So it's not necessarily the case that the, the phenomenon of economic globalization will just increase and rise uh, further. You might have a reversal, and in particular, given this, this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, situation, but also because of other driving forces. And there's a famous argument uh, made by, by um, Karl Polanyi from, uh, he wrote a book, I think it was in 1944, uh, The Great Transformation, which used these arguments and analyzed the period in, in um, preceding the First World War. 19th uh, century and you also had these di disruptions and the insecurity and losers from capitalism from market-based economies uh, which generated you know opposition and even though the united kingdom and, and a lot of european economies grew to an unprecedented extent and the phenomenon of globalization of interstate trade and investment really grew in that period uh, that also created instability. People needed to adapt, they needed to move to cities, and they, they, some lost their jobs, their incomes, because they were outcompeted. Uh, so Polanyi used that as an explanation, as a basic fundamental explanation that um, for the disruptions that eventually led to not only one world war, but, but two world wars. Um, people, Karl Polanyi argued, are not, you know, 
suited to pure globalization or to market-based economies because people tend to often, and many people at least, tend to prefer a certain level of security, familiarity, tradition. So that's also something to to watch today, the, the opposition, because it's clear opposition in many parts of the world to the phenomenon of globalization. Okay, the fifth driving force or correlate, um, we use the term black swans, because people used to think that there were only white swans and they were taken by surprise, I think it was in the 1800s or, or something, when suddenly there appeared a black swan. Things that are, and we use the, the reference to, to um, refer to things that really are unpredictable and kind of dramatic and has uh, and phenomena that have enormous impact. So typically a thing like the, the um, uh, well, the First World War can be framed as a, as a black swan. You had the, the uh, so-called Arab Spring in 2010, 2011, it started as, you know, one individual in Tunisia protesting and, and uh, setting himself on fire. And suddenly you had regimes falling, you had civil wars, you had protests, demonstrations, you had something that very few, if any at all, predicted. Um, with major consequences for, for, in particular, the North African Middle East regions, region. Uh, you had the end of the Cold War, which few people predicted. Relatively suddenly, historically speaking, it was relatively suddenly the Soviet Union collapsed. And the Cold War ended without a war. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate example is the coronavirus. And you can't, and nobody predicted you know, the exact year and moment and spread and effects of the coronavirus. Um, many competent people said that sooner or later we'll have a pandemic with, you know, consequences. Uh, but we can safely say that almost the entire world is pretty much shocked over the spread of the virus, the severity, and, and not least the effects. So that's a, a black swan that doesn't really automatically have to do with geopolitical risk, but it creates geopolitical risk, uh, or it has an effect on the political landscape, on the international politics. It increases the tension between the US and China. It increases nationalism. Borders are closed. Trade is hampered. And we're only at the start of, you know, seeing these effects. So, so we're uncertain at the moment of, of how this will end. Um, so that is also a typical black swan, which will be part of the topic for the second lecture. If we go to, you know, you have the globalization phenomenon, characterizing the post-Cold War period, still characterizing the world. And, and that's something, and if we combine that with the rise and fall and, or rise and decline of, of, of great powers, we can, uh, we can look at this, um, this cartoon, which kind of easily, demonstrate, uh, easily demonstrates the some of the issues now between the two biggest states in terms of economic and military power, it's the US and China. You have the Chinese dragon here and you have the US uh, there. And both say that if things don't improve between us, I will walk away in anger. So both say that. The problem is that these are so interconnected, these uh, to countries interconnected economically. You have a superpower rivalry, big power, great power rivalry now, great power tensions. Um, China is rising and want to shape, you know, rules and institutions, rules of the game. The US has to a large extent shaped the existing rules of the game. 
Um, this is not totally unlike the situation between the Soviet Union and the US after the Second World War. But one of the main differences, and perhaps the main difference between the Soviet-US conflict and the current Chinese-US conflict is that the Soviet economy was disconnected to the US economy. So, so what the US did and didn't do economically vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union had no real effect and vice versa. Whereas China and the US are so interconnected in terms of trade, investment, um, that, you know, to give one example, if China wanted, they could, within five minutes, totally destroy the US economy and cause the US, the value of the US dollar to collapse. Because essentially, China finances, you know, the deficits of the US. They, they lend money to the U.S. They buy bonds from the U.S. That's a way of the Chinese to invest their surplus. And that helps U.S. consumers, the U.S. economy. But if the Chinese started to sell these bonds, these loans, in effect, and we're talking about trillions of dollars here, uh, the, US, the U.S. dollar would collapse. So within five minutes, the Chinese can cause havoc. The trouble from the Chinese perspective, of course, is that they're totally dependent upon, you know, a thriving U.S. economy. China has grown partly because um, the U.S. has been a stable um, actor in the financial system, in, in economics, um, and it's a U.S.-shaped system. And the U.S. has its leverage over China. Chinese exports go to the U.S. So they're interconnected and it's, it's kind of, you know, a stranglehold that China theoretically and practically has on the U.S., but you, the U.S. has a stranglehold on China as well. So one of the big questions now is, you know, you know how far will these two go? Will they go far? Will, will we have a decoupling of these two economies? Uh, will we have a partial decoupling? If we have a full decoupling, the world would not be the same uh, in any way as, as we have grown used to. Or will you have, you know, is the case that these two, it's so costly to decouple, uh, to walk away in anger, as the cartoon says. Perhaps it's so costly that it won't happen. Um, so that's, you know, a direct, you know, link between interstate rivalry by these two biggest powers and international business and the economy. So, what I will do now uh, is to go relatively quickly, I think, through some recent examples. Now I've talked a little bit about geopolitical risk, a little bit about things connected to geopolitical risk. And here's a list of recent examples of, you know, concrete things that have um, shaped the fortunes, often in a negative way, of, of international investors. Things that have created uh, risks. One thing I've, I've spoken about is the U.S trade war, and you can say trade wars in using uh, plural, um, but most prominent is, you know, the Chinese-U.S. dimension that the U.S. has, has threatened, um, you know, South Korea and has threatened Japan, has threatened the EU, has threatened a lot of, of countries because the U.S. and the president thinks that and, and, and uh, believes that the U.S. is treated unfairly uh, in these existing trade deals, some of which have been renegotiated. Um, so the U.S. Instituted tar institutes tariffs and the other country uh, often uh, retaliates and then you have this you know, chain reaction going until you have a new settlement, uh, which you have in, in many cases. 
but the Chinese-U.S. relationship, it involves a lot of conflict dimensions. And one other dimension is the um, high-tech conflict. That has to do really with, uh, or part of it has to do with, you know, the um, attempt or aim, objective to have the technological leadership in the future. The mobile, the big uh, mobile phone, uh, Huawei, um, the U.S. has long since started a campaign against Huawei. Uh, and they asked their allies and friends and pressure their allies and friends to stop Huawei from, um, or to make them, to, to make it illegal for Huawei to invest in these 5G networks in, in uh, which really would partly control the infrastructure of several countries. Um, so now you have this, you know, big debate in European states, should Huawei be invited or blocked from investing in our critical infrastructure? Because Huawei is a Chinese company and Chinese, big Chinese companies are not necessarily that separated from the interests and strategies of this Chinese state which the U.S. essentially see as illegitimate. This is a major power, or great power rivalry that has entered into the high-tech uh, domain. It's not only about Huawei, it's about other um, such high-tech companies. And that won't go away. That it's, it's because it has to do with the importance of, for these big states to be and to continue to be uh, leaders in terms of the most advanced technology. The U.S. doesn't trust Chinese companies, it doesn't trust uh, the Chinese state, the Chinese Communist Party, which has ruled China for uh, since the end of the 1940s. And, and um, it fears Chinese technological leadership and it fears that China will become bigger, stronger, more powerful and more influential than the U.S. itself. So the anti-Huawei campaign and anti-high-tech Chinese company campaign is part of, of um, this great power rival. That is also the case with the U.S. and what we also see in the EU and, and Australia, the screening of foreign direct investment. Well, some of these countries, again, most notably the US, are reluctant to now to invite all these Chinese companies into um, their own country for different uh, reasons. Um, so you have increased screening. You have for national, so-called national security reasons, it's more difficult for a Chinese you know, say high tech company or, or other important big company to, to invest in, in Europe, in Australia, in the US. And it's far more risky now for Chinese companies, uh, in particular prominent high tech companies to invest in, in the US. So you have on these, in these domains, a gradual decoupling of, and, and gradual partial reversal of, you know, the, the normal globalization phenomenon. Um, and then you have the Hong Kong question, you know, these demonstrations, protests, and the new legislation that was recently instituted by China. Because Hong Kong has functioned as, as uh, its Chinese territory from 1997 when, you know, the British, which used to rule Hong Kong, handed it over to the Chinese, it has functioned as a separate economy, governed by, you know, market-based thinking, rule of law, and, and less intervention of, less uh, intervention by politicians, and, and less power. The Chinese government hasn't had, you know, power and, and uh, to interfere in the economy of Hong Kong. So it's been kind of a hub that ensured that Western companies, if they wanted to enter China, they have often gone via Hong Kong. 
as a more secure place. But recent events concerning Hong Kong has changed this equation. But it's it's still a, a um, it's still developing this this uh, story. Then you have the South China Sea dispute, and I will I will return to to this in near the end of the lecture series. I'll spend about half the lecture discussing the South China Sea which concerns Chinese um, ambitions to control really the whole uh, area and it concerns US and, and uh, Vietnamese and Indonesian and, and Taiwanese and, and uh, etc. ambitions to you know avoid China dominating that, that sea. And you have other such similar things um, as China grows, for instance, it, it becomes um, in its treatment of foreign companies, it becomes much more confident that it can pressure them to follow, you know, the Beijing line when it comes to some companies, for instance, some airlines, they, when you order plane tickets, you have, for instance, to, to say where, where you're from, which country you're from, and if you list Taiwan as a country, as an own country, as an airline, if you list that, if you give people the option, the Chinese react, Chinese government react, and that airline goes into trouble. It risks being banned from flying to China unless they uh, follow, follow the Chinese uh, preferences because China regards Taiwan as part of Chinese territory, essentially stolen from them by the Japanese in the late 19th uh, century. And you have other of these uh, things, um, these examples of geopolitical risk. You have the recent, and I, I briefly touched upon this um, earlier, the border skirmish, the dead Indian soldiers, you know, the, the thing that happened in, in the Himalayas, which spilled over into boycotts and into screening, additional screening by India of Chinese businesses. I will talk about the Chinese investment activities also later in, in the lecture series, because as the Chinese economy expands, their foreign activity, foreign economic activity span, and they have these huge um, so-called Belt and Road initiative involving a lot of countries, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, in, in Africa, in Latin America, where the Chinese send their workers, their companies, and they build infrastructure, they, they um, their mining companies, and there's a lot of, of uh, investment activity, uh, which also carries some risks um, for the Chinese companies and also for these, um, for Western firms, for instance, which are uh, often excluded from these projects. And you have other things, I won't go into details about all these examples. I mentioned briefly the South Korea-Japan tensions, which is an ongoing case. And it's really a sensitive issue for, for the Koreans, given their, you know, the colonial past of, of, of um, Japan as a colonizer. And, and you had the Russia sanctions, the sanctions instituted by the US and by the EU against Russia for Russia's annexation of the Crimea in 2014. You have a pipeline issue also linked to Russia, pipeline running from, from Russia to Germany, which the US protests heavily against. And there's a lot of European companies including uh, included in that. And the US um, doesn't want to see that natural gas pipeline project completed and they threaten sanctions against these firms. It essentially threatened that if EU firms, 
firms from Europe, if they don't withdraw from that pipeline project, they can't do business with America. And that's part of the leverage of, of the U.S. is that their economy is so attractive and the control over the financial system is so strong, international financial system, that companies can't really risk being excluded from the American market. It, they can't really risk being excluded from uh, international banking from access to, to the dollar. So the U.S. You know, power in that respect is, is big. What the U.S. does and doesn't do has enormous impact on, on these firms. You have a second pipeline running from, from Russia to via Turkey and up the, the Balkans, which is also under pressure from, from the Americans to with sanctions threat and, and the like. You have a reciprocal skepticism now when it comes to media firms, journalists or TV channels, uh, the Chinese throw out, you know, US journalists and the US throws out Chinese journalists, um, the United Kingdom bans, which is in a diplomatic and, and conflict with Russia, they ban Russian TV channels, uh, and the Russians, you know, make life difficult for BBC and for, for English TV channels and also uh, some other European media firms. Cyber attacks is, of course, a big issue now. Uh, sometimes it's from state actors. In other instances, there are criminals attacking firms. Um, and these big states are often implicated, one would surmise. Uh, China has a big cyber capacity and, and Russia has it, Iran has it, North Korea has it. Uh, North Korea has ha apparently hacked several uh, businesses. And then you have the Middle East situation, you have the Iran sanctions companies cannot do business with Iran because they're automatically excluded from the American market and from access to the dollar from the international financial system. So the U.S. is pressuring Iran and it, and it has instituted what it calls secondary sanctions. It's nothing illegal for a company to do business with Iran. It's just that the Americans don't like it. So they will uh, punish any company doing business with Iran. The effect of that is that companies don't do business with Iran. If they do, they are either small and they don't, you know, uh, need access to the American market, uh, or they're, they're um, you know, they do it secretly, illegally from the American perspective. And you have other things happening in, in the same area. The last year or so has been rife with attacks, you know, on tankers in, in the Persian Gulf. Um, attacked and, 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 of course, if you remember the Iranians during a tense situation in January, uh, after the Americans killed that Iranian general, uh, Qasem Soleimani, um, the Iranians by accident shoot, uh, shot down an airline in Iran, Ukrainian airline. You have recent sanctions against Syria instituted by the Americans, essentially saying, yet again, if you do business with that regime, you can't do business with the US and, and we will punish you. That means that most companies cannot risk trying to go into Syria to rebuild the economy, to invest here, invest there. You have the Libya war, where the country is effectively split into half. And you have this war, warlord, Khalifa Haftar, having more or less control over, over a lot of these oil fields, oil and natural gas fields. Uh, Equinor is, is part owner of, of one of them of this gas field, so it directly affects them. So Libya is an oil and natural gas rich economy which doesn't export or produce that much oil and natural gas because of, of the war. 
you have a new, uh, relatively recent maritime dispute in Eastern Mediterranean involving, without going into details, involving Turkey, Cyprus, Greece, and, and actually yesterday France sent some uh, a military ship and, and a couple of, of fighter jets to the area because France is involved in a dispute with, with Turkey and and Turkey is really arguing that they own much larger parts of the Eastern Mediterranean than other countries accept. So this is a maritime dispute which I will devote one of the later lectures to. And then you have, you know, terrorism risk. Um, I've listed a few countries where, where it has been notable in the last a uh, few weeks and months, Mozambique, um, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, where a lot of mining activity goes on in really risky areas. The Sahel Belt, which is, is um, this large area south of where the Sahara goes into, you know, um, it's non-sand but dry, dry, arid uh, area. It involves Mali and Burkina Faso, uh, Mauritania and, and uh, Niger. And you have had several really gruesome attacks, sometimes involving mining companies from from other con countries. A year or so ago, I think about 40, 50 workers of a Canadian company were killed by, by jihadists. Uh, you have pirate attacks in West Africa, partly Singapore, West Africa, that's a huge problem, you know. Either criminals or, you know, rebel groups, they attack tankers or other such ships outside Nigeria, Benin, Cameroon and take them uh, hostage and, and demand you know, money for their release. Um, you have U.S. sanctions against Venezuela, you have U.S. sanctions against Cuba. Again, you cannot easily, as an international company, then do business with Venezuela or Cuba. Again, because you're excluded from the all-important American market and the all-important international financial system. And you have some more domestic, you know, thing, you have corruption problems and some companies, many companies actually are implicated in, in such things. And then you have some, in some instances, resource nationalism. There's a big mining company that recently, uh, they're involved in, in the biggest project in, in the state of Mongolia, north of China, uh, between China and Russia. And, and Rio Tinto, Mongolia wants to renegotiate and has renegotiated uh, the deal with Rio Tinto, a big, a huge, one of the world's largest copper mines. The point of this list is really to give a hint of what the practical implications of international conflicts or, or strategies by big powers and, and medium-sized powers are when it comes to, to some of these firms. So that really concludes the second part of this first lecture and, and I will after a short break uh, record the third one and last one where I will also deal with some of the practicalities, the formalities uh, linked to, to this course. So um, then I will break this recording and uh, I'll start anew in a few minutes.